see you all. My name is Dana Alexander. I'm director of the Office of Life Planning. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Gerald Sitzer to you. Um, he is here to speak in chapel, which he just did, but also to uh, do a retreat for our department, um, which is coming up uh, tonight and Saturday. Uh, Jerry has been at uh, Whitworth College for since 1989 as a professor of theology. He is a uh, father and a husband, but also a writer of some wonderful books. I only have three of them here because they're the ones I have read. So uh, one is called Water from a Deep Well, Christian Spirituality from Early Martyrs to Christian Missionaries. This is one I used in my own devotional life and found it to be uh, just wonderful. I recommend it highly. Then he has written a book called A Grace Disguised, How the Soul Grows Through Loss. And this book I would commend to you. It is, in my opinion and the opinion of many, the, one of the best, if not the best, book on loss and grieving that is out there. Um, he lost his mother, his wife, and a daughter in a drunk driving accident. And uh, he talks about that in there, but... but how he dealt with that is just amazing and wonderful and inspiring and, and quite helpful. And then lastly is the book, The Will of God as a Way of Life, which is the featured material really for the retreat that is coming up here this weekend. And I would just put a pitch in for that. If students, if you have thought about coming or might want to, there is absolutely still time. It's going to be starting this evening at dinner at 5.30 and then we'll continue on to Saturday from breakfast until about 4 o'clock. And I realize there's much going on, but you're welcome to do that. And you could uh, talk to one of us or just call the Office of Life Planning, and we'd be happy to help you there. So thank you all for coming, and uh, please welcome. Oh, one last thing. I do have copies of uh, Dr. Sitzer's talk, and I, I'm sure there's more material in there than you're able to cover in the talk. So I have 10 copies, and you're welcome to grab one of those after if you would like. And I also have it um, on, as a document on my computer, and I can get that to you if we run out. So let's welcome Dr. Jerry Sitzer. Thank you, Dana. <clears throat> I want to preface this uh, sort of quasi-paper I'm presenting here uh, to say that uh, a number of years ago, I began to read uh, uh, the Church Fathers in earnest, and more than the Church Fathers, but try to get inside the world of the early Christian period. I, I'm an historian. I actually got my PhD at the University of Chicago in American uh, church history, but have really shifted my uh, passion over the year, or discovered my passion, in the history of spirituality, and especially the uh, early Christian period. And it took me a long time to figure out what was going on, and I want to tell you right away what happened to me. Um, when you read the Reformers, um, Calvin, Luther, Menno Simons, and so on, you realize that they're really fighting against each other uh, over how to define Christian truth. It was basically an internecine kind of battle. And it's valuable to read them. And obviously, I favor some more over others. But uh, they, were, they were writing into and out of Christendom. But the church fathers were writing in a pre-Christian world. And it changes the tone of their writing. Now, there are a number of things that are absent in early Christianity. There's no robust doctrine of justification by faith, for example, which I like. And there are some other things that they just plain don't address. I just think they didn't have the time and energy for it because their battle was different. As I'll state here, it was really a battle against pag paganism more so and Judaism. They weren't fighting other Christians. They weren't other Christians. Um, and in our culture, which is becoming what I would argue increasingly post-Christian, the relevance of these church fathers in my mind keep going up. I mean, I'll, I'll speak just for myself here. I don't worry about Catholics anymore. Fifty years ago, a lot of evangelical Protestants were worried about Catholics. Who does that anymore? It's a waste of time. Maybe if you're in the South, you'll do it. I hope it isn't being recorded yet when I say this. But, <laughs> or, or the Eastern Orthodox. You know, we're not, we're not the, the squabbles within and among Christians is diminishing as we recognize that the battle around the globe, if I can use that military language somewhat uncomfortably, uh, is 
over secularity. And so the relevance of these church fathers, in my mind, grows as we stop fighting each other. And the questions that they raised uh, become, in my mind, all the more relevant. Now, that's that first thing. So I've read a lot in this area, both in my teaching and in my writing. The other thing is I discovered by accident, maybe three or four years ago, the early Christian catechumenate. And this has become a deep passion of mine. Uh, the catechumenate was basically a training program to prepare people for baptism, and I'm going to introduce it to you today. There's a lot of information on this, but nobody or very few people discuss it, teach it. I've talked to many people who graduated from seminaries, and you mentioned the catechumenate, and they go, what? It's simply not something explored, which strikes me as strange because of its pastoral relevancy. And I'll suggest even relevancy for schools like Westmont and Whitworth. So that is preface, uh, prefaces my comments. Now to my paper, I'll talk. I have a number of slides of quotes, by the way. I thought it would be interesting for you to get in the mind of the, uh, of the church fathers. And especially, I'm going to highlight a number of quotes from Hippolytus's apostolic tradition. I'll give you a little bit of historical information about that as well. So here we go. I'm going to kind of read this a little bit, so I trust that you'll listen carefully here, but I want to be as, move as quickly as I, I can, and when you speak extemporaneously, it tends to lengthen. Okay, Eusebius of Caesarea, bishop, theologian, and friend of Constantine, wrote the first history of the church around uh, 325, something like that. His account is valuable for many reasons, one of which was his habit of including long quotes from primary documents that he used as sources, sometimes pages long. These quotes provide a window into the life of the early Christian period. For example, Eusebius quotes extensively from a letter from the Church of Gaul that tells the story of a rash of martyrdoms that occurred in Vienne and Lyon in the year 177. Entitled The Gallic Martyrs, the story recounts the suffering and public execution of such notables as Blandina, Sanctus, and Plothinus. He actually died in the dungeon, but then he was a 90-year-old bishop when he died. Typical of such accounts, it was written during a period of persecution to encourage and charge believers to remain faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, whether in life or in death, and... It used athletic training and competition as a metaphor for the demands of discipleship. As the letter reads, some of the Gallic believers had submitted to rigorous uh, training and had therefore prepared themselves for the ultimate test of faith, while others had avoided or neglected such training and exposed to the pressure of persecution had failed. Now I'm quoting from this document dated to 177. It was clear that some were ready to be the first Gallic martyrs. They made a full confession of their testimony with the greatest eagerness. It was equally clear that others were not ready, that they had not trained and were still flabby. In no fit condition to face the strain of a struggle to the death. Now, thus do we encounter the original version of muscular Christianity. Athletic metaphors abound in early Christian literature, and they point to a view of discipleship that dominated the period. Of course, there's no way of discovering how spiritually fit ordinary believers actually were. We don't have that kind of documentation. We only know what the church leaders described and prescribed through their writing and preaching. Still, we do know that the church grew steadily during the third, uh, second and third generations, uh, or centuries, excuse me, in spite of or perhaps because of the threat of persecution and the formidable task of winning pagans to Christianity. The church was so successful, in fact, that it earned the title of being a new race or third race of people. Has anyone ever heard of that phrase, new race or third race? It appears in a lot of second and third century documentation. Not Jewish, not pagan, but Christian, and attracted the attention of critics like Celsus, the kind of Harvard professor of the late second century, who attacked and mocked the fledgling faith, so nervous was he 
about its growing influence. Now, the muscular Christianity of the early Christian period meant something very different back then from what it means today. Rather than embodying a kind of manly Christianity of brawn, uh, brash, and bravado, the original version emphasized radical discipleship. That is, genuine faith in Christ, dis discipline of the appetites, cultivation of virtue, and faithfulness under persecution. Women had just as much opportunity to become muscular believers as men. You'll notice in martyr accounts, a lot of women, like Perpetua, are uh, featured in those accounts. Um, aged and infirmed, as well as young and fit. The only qualification was a willingness to follow Jesus as Lord. John Chrysostom put it so well, I'm quoting from this late uh, fourth century sermon, the wrestlings of virtue do not depend on age or bodily strength. Notice the play on words. Wrestling does not uh, depend on age or bodily strength, but only on the spirit and the disposition. Thus, women have been crowned victors while men have been upset. The many references to athletics reinforce the notion that Christians should take discipleship as seriously as athletes do training and competition. Discipleship, in short, was not for the faint of heart and weak of will. The church fathers confessed that Jesus suffered and died for humanity's salvation, to be sure, but they also believed that he set an example that Christians should follow. They affirmed that grace puts people on the team. They also argued that discipline makes the team fit for competition. Now, in my mind, the church fathers only followed biblical precedent, for they found plenty of references to athletics in the Apostle Paul. The very men who inspired the reformers to herald justification by faith also stressed the demands of discipleship. Paul never stopped with grace alone. He spelled out its implications too. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know the rest of that text, obviously. Paul borrowed extensively from the Mediterranean culture he knew so well to illustrate his point. As a diaspora Jew, he grew up in Tarsus, lived for a time in Antioch of Syria, and visited some of the largest cities of the Roman world. By the way, these cities could easily number over 100,000. Antioch, 250,000. Rome, 750,000. Ephesus, 250,000. It's astonishing to consider the size of those cities. And in his travels, he could not have entirely avoided or ignored the ubiquitous presence of athletic competition that permeated these cities, which boasted huge stadiums, gymnasiums, and baths, and hosted games of all sorts. I don't know if you've traveled, but uh, in some of these cities, they have uh, uncovered uh, st uh, stadium, stadia in, uh, in their excavations, and uh, some of these seated 30,000 to 50,000 people in granite or marble. They're gorgeous places. While Jesus told his disciples to take up the cross and follow him, a sober reminder to Jews who were all too familiar with this brutal form of Roman execution, Paul exhorted be believers, most of whom were Gentiles, to train as if they were spiritual athletes. So I'll give you just a couple of quotes here. Train yourself in godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Or this text, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Well, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. And by the way, running and boxing were both sports that were... Uh, uh, um, used in, in the stadium, but I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, the church fathers employed similar metaphors, a sign that they too wanted to reach Gentiles 
who watched and even participated in athletic competition. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Clement of Alexandria believed that the goal of the Christian faith is to train and thus form students, not merely to inform them. Such training, he said, engenders virtue, what he calls moral loveliness and disciplines behavior. And Clement's an interesting case study because he valued classical learning. He was saturated with it. When you read Clement of Alexandria, you run into quotes and references to myths and other uh, uh, classical uh, images and texts. Uh, so he valued a classical education, but he believed that a Christian education sort of was at, was at the pinnacle of that and that classical education should serve the end of discipleship. So in his Pythagogus, he writes this. The instructor being practical, not theoretical, his aim is thus to improve the soul, not to teach and to train up to a virtuous, not an intellectual life. And by the way, the instructor is Jesus. There is a wide difference between health and knowledge. For the latter is produced by learning, the former by healing. One who is ill will not therefore learn any branch of instruction till he is quite well. And there is one mode of trading for philosophers, another for orators, and another for athletes. So is there a generous disposition suitable for the choice that is set upon moral loveliness, great phrase, resulting from, uh, from the training of Christ. And in the case of those who have been trained according to this influence, their gait in walking, their sitting at table, their food, their sleep, their going to bed, their regimen, and the rest of their mode of life acquire a superior dignity. For such a training as is pursued by the word is not overstrained, but is of the right tension. Tertullian, a contemporary, they were contemporaries. Tertullian is uh, one of the Latin fathers, the first Latin father, Clement, one of the earlier Greek fathers. Tertullian wrote in Carthage, Clement in Alexandria, obviously. Tertullian viewed discipleship as preparation for martyrdom, which required submission to a regimen of training that would prepare them for the ultimate test. Harsh treatment, severe discipline, and persistence inevitably lead to virtue. So he writes in two martyrs, I won't read all this. In like manner, O blessed ones, count whatever is hard in this lot of yours as a discipline of your power of mind and body. You are about to pass through a noble struggle in which the living God acts the part of the superintendent, in which the Holy Ghost is your trainer, in which the prize is an eternal crown of angelic essence, citizenship in the heavens, glory everlasting. Therefore, your master, Jesus Christ, who has anointed you with his, his spirit, and led you forth to the arena, has seen it good before the day of conflict to take you from a condition more pleasant in itself and has imposed on you a harder treatment that your strength might be the greater. For the athletes too are set apart to a more stringent discipline that they may have their physical powers built up. They are kept from luxury, from daintier meats, from more pleasant drinks, they are pressed, racked, worn out. The harder their labors and the preparatory training, the stronger is the hope of victory. We, with the crown eternal in our eye, look upon the prison as our training ground, that at the goal of final judgment we may be brought forth well disciplined by many a trial, since virtue is built up by hardship as by voluptuous indulgence it is overthrown. Only Tertullian could write with that kind of rhetorical flourish, by the way. He's very entertaining to read. I suggest, by the way, there's a paper edition of a, a book called Early Christian Life, and it's on things like the shows, his view of dress, entertainment, food. And it's moving, but also incredibly entertaining. I have my students read that book with a, a great deal of pleasure. Now, the use of athletic metaphors persisted long after official persecution ended. Even if Christians would no longer die for Christ, they could still live for him and through rigorous training become bloodless martyrs. It's the phrase they used. The cost would be different, of course. Nevertheless, there would still be a cost. Thus, Ambrose stated in one of his catechetical sermons, can an athlete enjoy leisure once he is given in his name for an event? No, 
He trains and is anointed every day. He is given special food. Discipline is imposed on him. He is, he is to keep himself chaste. You two have been given, you two have given in your name for Christ's contest. You have entered for an event and its prize is a crown. Practice, train, anoint yourself with the oil of gladness, an anointment that is uh, never used up. Your food should be frugal, without intemperance or self-indulgence. Your drink should be more sparing, for fear of drunkenness should catch you unawares. Keep your body chaste so as to be fit to wear the crown. Otherwise, your reputation may lose you the favor of the spectators, and your supporters may see your negligence and abandon you. Because they would bet on these things. They would bet uh, according to teams. There would be a red team, white team, green team, and so on. The archangels, the powers, and dominions, the 10,000 times 10,000 angels are watching you. Before such spectators have uh, some sense of shame and consider how dishonorable such conduct should be. I have one other quote from John Chrysostom, same kind of imagery that's used. You find this frequently in the church fathers from the second through the fourth century. So I'm going to, to skip that and go on to uh, the argument. Well, what I want to do is explore how the church fathers use these athletic metaphors, focusing attention on three ideas briefly. First, the contest for which believers were being prepared. Second, the competition they faced. Third, the program of training that was put to wide use. So first, the contest. As you well know, early contests involving Christians were not held in the stadium or in gymnasiums, but in the arena. And Christians did not run and box for prizes, race chariots, or fight with the sword, but died as helpless victims instead. Scholars have no idea how many Christians actually died in the arena. The numbers were probably not very high, perhaps running to 1,000 or so in the first two centuries. Still, that these martyrdoms were public and brutal events left an indelible impression on everyone. The message was frighteningly clear. Being a disciple of Jesus means that you must be ready and willing to die. Rome did not especially like the new religions that were flooding the empire, and it called those new religions superstitions. Though it tolerated them, it eventually absorbed them into its religious landscape, and in most cases, pantheon of gods. But it did not and could not absorb Christianity in the same way because Christians called Jesus Lord, claimed that Jesus was the only way of salvation, we call it Christo-exclusivity, and followed Jesus with such zeal that they refused to attend the shows in theater, thus earning them the reputation of being, quote, haters of humankind as Tacitus put it. The accusation leveled against Polycarp, 86-year-old bishop who was martyred in 155, sums it up most succinctly, quote, this one is the teacher of Asia, the father of Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches many not to worship and to sacrifice, telling, quote, Thus Rome turned against Christianity and Christians, sending many to their death in dungeon and arena. Still, however horrifying and intimidating, martyrdom served a useful purpose too. It announced that discipleship exacts a cost. Cost demands commitment. Commitment might require an ultimate sacrifice. Christianity should, is therefore a highly valuable prize. The popularity of martyr stories, the martyrdoms of Perpetua and Polycarp come to mind here, only reinforced the point. In effect, these stories announced, this is how a genuine disciple lives. Prepare yourself, you could be next. The account of Polycarp's martyrdom illustrates the point. His dead body serves as a symbol of cost and crown, a source of warning as well as of inspiration. Christians better be serious about the faith they profess. Now I'm quoting from that document. So we later took up his bones, more precious than costly stones and more valuable than gold, and laid them away in a suitable place. There the Lord will permit us, as far as possible, 
to gather together in joy and gladness to celebrate the day of his martyrdom as a birthday in memory, now listen, in memory of those athletes who have gone before and to train and make ready those who are to come hereafter. End of quote. Martyrdom came to an end after Constantine assumed the throne, as we all know. Christians no longer entered the arena to die as martyrs. The church fathers, however, were unwilling to abandon the use of athletic metaphors. They simply applied them differently. The contest continued. Only the setting had changed. The desert took the place of the arena. Christians were still called to be martyrs, to be sure, only bloodless martyrs, as I mentioned before. They still had to compare or prepare for the contest. The desert fathers and mothers became the new heroes of the church. They withdrew into the desert, a metaphor for combat, struggle, and death. As spiritual athletes, they continued to engage in the great battle. They sought after God, disciplined the appetites, and fought the devil. The real battle was no longer against Rome, and perhaps it had never been Rome after all. The place of ultimate combat was the human heart. The real contest was between God and the devil. The final prize was nothing less than the soul's salvation. That's the contest. Now for the competition. The church fathers studied and knew the competition well. You find it all over the place. Much of the literature from the second through the fourth centuries, in other words, from Justin Martyr and Athenagoras to Gregory of Nyssa, addressed two foes in particular. One was Judaism, the other was paganism, the two most formidable religious competitors Christianity faced in the ancient world. The church fathers faced a daunting task for the vast majority of people knew virtually nothing about Christianity. That ignorance plunged deeper than we could imagine living as we do in a culture that is so familiar with Christianity. It is old now. Back then it was new. We might be living in a post-Christian world. They were living in a pre-Christian world. There's a huge difference between the two, as you know. For at least our world still has the memory, the categories, and the lingering influence of Christianity. There was little in ancient culture outside Judaism that predisposed people, especially pagans, to understand and accept Christian belief and follow the Christian way of life. The entire religious orientation of the ancient world, its view of religion, its moral behavior, its daily practices, diverged from Christianity. The typical Roman city devoted some 30 to 40 percent of its property to public buildings, most, uh, most of which had a religious or quasi-religious function. Religious and political life were so intertwined that public and political officials presided over the religious rituals of the city attending to its many religious buildings and festivals. They were priests, in other words, as well as political figures. People did not so much believe in religion, they had religion and used religion. They visited temples, sacrificed to the gods, paid homage to the emperor, attended religious festivals, performed religious functions at shrines and monuments, dabbled in the mystery cults, kept household gods, all to ensure that life would remain good, that Rome itself would continue to prosper, that evil and suffering would be kept at bay. This kind of ubiquitous pluralistic religion imposed a huge burden on the church to explain the Christian faith and way of life with enough clarity and cogency that potential converts would know what they were getting themselves into. A simple yes to Jesus was hardly adequate, given that most people had no idea who Jesus was. Methods of evangelism and standards of church membership might work in our context, uh, might, which would work in our context, uh, failed in that context. The gap between pagan and Christian was simply too big. Christians could assume virtually nothing when trying to reach the lost. Now, I have some slides on a fabulous second century document called the so-called Letter to Diognetus. It's, it's actually very moving. And uh, not many people are that familiar with it. We don't quite know when it was written, maybe somewhere between 130 and 160. 
We don't know the author. We, aren't, we don't even know who Diognetus is. Scholars have really had to work hard to place this document, but that's where they place it. What's interesting about the document is the first one I know of that actually mentions the phrase new race or third race. And in addressing this court official, pagan court official, Diognetus, or excuse me, the unknown author uh, makes it very clear that the recipient of the letter knows enough about Christianity, especially its behavior, that he can call it this new or third race and it would have a familiar ring to it. And when he begins his, or, or, the beginning of the document, he gives a kind of superficial critique of both, of both Judaism and paganism. But then he launches into a longer description of Christianity. And ironically, to make his apologetic case, he begins by describing Christian behavior. He does not begin with Christian belief. And we wouldn't do that anymore because we're too embarrassed with Christian behavior. Right? I mean, the new atheists are using it as an argument against Christianity. But in his case, he does it to argue for Christianity. So this is how he begins. And I just want to read a couple of lines from it. For Christians cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by country or language or custom. In short, when you see him walking down the street, you wouldn't know they were Christian. They do not live in cities of their own. That would be his criticism against what religion? Judaism. They were sequestered. They were isolated. And they wore clothes that set them apart. They do not use a peculiar form of speech. Uh, they do not follow an eccentric manner of life. They live in their own countries. Now listen to this term. They live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They have a share in everything as citizens and endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their fatherland, and yet for them every fatherland is a foreign land. The fab I mean, this person's been rhetorically uh, trained. This is a fabulous use of language. They marry like everyone else and they beget children, but they do not cast out their offspring. What's he referring to there? And infanticide, exposure of children, especially what gender? Female. Female. Uh, they share their board with each other, but not their marriage bed. It is true that they are in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh, and on it goes. This fantastic description of behavior that the recipient of the, of the letter already is familiar with and recognizes. Then he says, considering this behavior, what kind of belief system would inspire it? And where does he go to? The incarnation. And in this fabulous turning point in the document, he said, now, did God send him, meaning his son, as a human mind might assume to rule by tyranny, fear, and terror? I mean, when we imagine an incarnation, we think of a Hercules or a sage, some kind of person of, with, that has cultural power. Far from it. He sent him out of kindness and gentleness, like a king sending a son who is himself a king. He sent him as God. He sent him as man. There you go right there. It's a, it's a sophisticated Christology dating to the early second century. He willed to save man by persuasion, not by compulsion. For compulsion is not God's way of working. In sending him, God called men but did not pursue them. He sent him in love, not in judgment. And I've got uh, that down, uh, and I've got it in my paper, too, if you want to see the full length of quotes. All right, now let me just jump into the third point. Uh, the regimen of training are called the catechumenate. The Church Fathers designed a training program to prepare converts for the contest and the competition, to enable them to face martyrdom and to win pagans. This training program was called the catechumenate which developed over time to prepare earnest seekers known as catechumens for full membership in the church. Now, in my paper, I go into the Greek background of the term. It comes from a, a Greek verb called katakeo, uh, which means to sound downward from above. I'm not going to uh, explore that. 
very, uh, very much now, except to say it's used very rarely in the New Testament and doesn't appear in the Septuagint at all. So most scholars would say that the New Testament writers, Paul and uh, later the church fathers, took a term that was simply in, uh, not in usage, a rare term to be able to pour into it a unique content. And they did not use a number of other terms that would be used for, say, train or teach. They wanted to find a word that would do this very specific kind of work. Where Tertullian, Clement, Origen, and Hippolytus, all roughly contemporaries, used the term to refer to a regimen of training to which I have already referred, by their day it had already become formalized into what we now the cate know as the catechumenate. They all mentioned that term, catechumen, catechumenate, and refer to some kind of training program that the church had developed. That's very or late second, early third century. But there are hints of it all over the place much earlier. You just got to know what you're looking for. There are hints of it in the Didache, an early second century document. There are hints of it in Justin Martyr. I've got all the quotes from those documents that underscore this basic idea that before a person was to submit to baptism, they had to have more than familiarity with kind of loose church doctrine. They had to know the faith, and they had to be able to show evidence of living the faith. In other words, there was a kind of seamlessness between belief, belonging, and behavior required before baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, which were events that occurred at the same time. Well, the document that provides the most information is actually uh, dates from the early third century, and uh, it's a manual. That's the reason why we have so much information. The other authors, like Origen, Tertullian, and so on, provide it more in passing reference, in a paragraph or two, but they don't describe it in detail. But the apostolic tradition does. Now, scholars aren't quite sure how to date this document because it's a manual it probably evolved over time. But surely the roots of it, the beginnings of it, and its use date to the early third century in Rome. Final form probably reached sometime in the fourth century. So we've got around the year 215 when scholars say this document was probably first penned. Again, we can be confident because so many of the church fathers, contemporaries with Hippolytus, Mention the catechumenate as a kind of full blown program that seemed to be used empire wide in various adaptations and permutations. So I'm going to expose you now to uh, the catechumenate. There are three things I want to mention, and I'll move through these fairly quickly. The first was enrollment, the second, the actual instruction and the third, uh, the rites of uh, initiation. So we turn to this manual of church practices. First, the document explains the process of enrollment into the catechumenate. The Christian movement grew at the grassroots level, as you well know, Christians reaching their relatives, friends, and neighbors through daily interaction in public places. I saw this for sure a year and a half ago when I was leading a study tour of 28 Whitworth students with my colleague Jim Edwards in Turkey. Has the best excavated sites from the ancient world. And we stopped one day in Nicaea. And it was a fairly warm day for January. And I, I swear the entire city was outside. And you saw this culture of cafe conversation and marketplace with people interacting all over the place. Nobody looking at their watches, nobody rushing off, no cars. And it, it made sense for the first time how the early Christian movement grew. Every day people went to the marketplace, no refrigerators. People lived in tiny little cubicles. The density of population, scholars say, in the ancient world in these urban centers was more dense than Manhattan. And where does Manhattan put its people? The tallest building in a place like Antioch and Ephesus was four stories. So density, constant interaction, and Christians would make friends with, with merchants, neighbors, relatives, and gradually begin to introduce them to the Christian faith. Well, here's the question. Once contact was made and interest in Christianity emerged, 
what happened next. Obviously, the relationship between believers and what I'm going to call seekers matured, which put believers in a position to invite seekers to begin the process of becoming a Christian and entering into the life of the church. Notice, begin the process. It was not a one-event deal. That's evangelical notion of conversion. That's an 18th century invention, fairly new in the history of Christianity. A time would come when believers would introduce their seeker friends to a church leader who would examine them, notice, examine them to see if they were ready to be enrolled in the catechumenate, thus becoming catechumens. Such an examination was intended to do a kind of background check on seekers and to discern if they were indeed ready to be enrolled in the catechumenate. In most cases, the believers who brought their seeker friends would serve as, here's the term that was used, sponsor or godparent, both from the early Christian period uh, and move through the entire process with them, functioning in effect as a mentor. So here is how the apostolic tradition puts it. Notice the timing, the examination, readiness of the con. Uh, of the candidate and the role of the sponsor. I'm going to read this one now. Those who come forward the first time to hear the word, that is on an official level, shall first be brought to the teachers at the house, notice we don't have church buildings yet, before all the people come in, that is for worship. Let them be examined as to the reason why they have come forward to the faith. And those who bring them shall bear witness, there's the sponsor, shall bear witness for them whether they are able to hear. Let their life and manner of living be inquired into, whether he has a wife and whether he is a slave or free. If he be the slave or a believer and his master permits him, let him hear. If his master does not bear witness, let him be rejected, etc., etc. And then it talks about marriage and so on. Now what's interesting is that they also inquired into their professions. I have a slide. And if people were doing professions that were too embedded in pagan, the pagan world, that is sculpting idols or teaching in a pagan school where they have to teach all the myths, they would have to desist or they'd be rejected as catechumens. You know, it's hard for us to imagine, or they would ask if they're prostitutes or if they're pimps or if they race chariots. Anybody here worried about having prostitutes in their church? I mean, the, the list of professions, if you read between the lines, tells you the kind of people they were reaching. Real pagans, not people transferring from a Baptist church. See? Now you think about the project that they faced in moving these pagans into the Christian fold. It was an enormous undertaking. And it required, again, this kind of training program. There is. Uh, all the lists of occupations and crafts that were disallowed. But we're going to move to the next slide. Oh, by the, this is confirmation of the fourth century Egeria on the enrollment of the catechumen in Jerusalem. We're going to skip that one and get on to Hippolytus. So anyway, they would go through this enrollment, this examination, and they'd be assigned a kind of sponsor, basically a mentor. And then they would begin this period of formal instruction. Sponsors were supposed to sit through the instruction with them. Nice way to relearn material, right? Is you're reviewing all the time if you're a mentor. And uh, show them how to apply it to ordinary life, thus giving the impression that learning mere information about Christianity was not enough. That was not the goal. It wasn't so that you could spit back the Ten Commandments of the Apostles' Creed. It's that you learned the Christian faith and its relationship to behavior in such a way that you were actually practicing it. We know that's the case because before final baptism, they went through a second examination called the scrutiny. <laughs> and they not only asked questions about what so-and-so believed, they asked questions about how they lived. So that catechumenate period was meant to basically disciple people. Let a catechumen be instructed for three years. This is not a weekend member, new members class. But if a man be earnest and persevere well in the matter, let him be received because it is not the time that is judged, but notice the, say it, conduct. conduct. Notice it's not 
intellectual grasp of the Christian faith. It's not memory verses. It's a whole way of life. Each time the teacher finishes his instructed, let the catechumens pray for themselves apart from the men, both the baptized women and the women catechumens. But after the prayer is finished, let the catechumens uh, is finished. The catechumens shall not give the kiss of peace, for their kiss is not yet pure. So one of the things liturgically they could not do was give the kiss of peace, nor recite the Lord's Prayer. That was only for people who had been baptized in Eucharist. After the prayer of the catechumens, let the teacher lay hands upon them and pray and dismiss them, whether the teacher be an ecclesiastic, in other words, official church leader, or layman, let him do the same. Uh, we have a lot of in, uh, uh, information about the instruction itself from fourth century documents because we actually have cate catechetical sermons from Ambrose, Chrysostom, Cyril of Jerusalem, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Ambrose, and it gives some idea of the kind of curriculum they passed through. Cyril uh, of Jerusalem, for example, spent 50 hours going through the biblical story from Genesis to Revelation. So they'd get that story in them. And when you get the story in you, you start to think about your own life and how your own life fits into that salvation story, you see. And then creed, line by line, Lord's Prayer, and then moral instruction using the Ten Commandments or, and or the Sermon on the Mount. Instruction for, in many cases, the instruction on the sacraments would be after baptism and Eucharist in what they called the mystagogue, which would be in the eight days after, um, uh, after, the, um, after baptism and, and a Eucharist and uh, that sort of thing. Okay, now, finally, um, um, the uh, rites of initiation. A at the end of this period, during Holy Week, uh, the catechumens, now prepared and so on, would move into this last phase of the catechumenate and the rites uh, of initiation. What you notice is how highly choreographed these sets of rituals called the rites of initiation were. Uh, it would begin during Holy Week and culminate on Easter morning. These rites of initiation were intended to reflect a spirit of solemnity and mystery, and they enabled the catechumens to pass from outsider to insider, from candidate to member. As I mentioned once before, the rites invited candidates into the story of salvation because the various rituals in which they participated embodied the story. So the rituals fit what the goal was. They weren't token. They didn't happen quickly. They were, again, highly choreographed. And these rituals included exorcisms, lots of them, anointings, more than one, including one when the candidate was stark naked, fastings, vigils, a scrutiny. And when they scrutinized him, these are the questions they asked, not do you drink, smoke, and chew and go with those who do? No, seriously, it was, do you, do you take care of the poor? Do you visit prisoners? Do you welcome and care for the widow? Do you look out for orphans? You see what's going on? They're trying to create a, a workforce of, a, 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 really, a team of spiritual athletes so that belief, behavior and belonging became somewhat seamless. So the, the scrutiny, a renunciation of the devil that the candidate would do, an affirmation of faith, a Trinitarian baptism, a symbolic use of clothing, congregational welcome, kiss of peace, recitation of the creed, culminating Eucharist, and a final period of instruction during Easter week. All of this happening over a three to four or seven day period of time. So this is... Um, a document from it. They have here the, oh, that's, excuse me, that's Egeria. We'll skip that and get on to the rites of initiation from Hippolytus. When they are chosen who are set apart to receive baptism, let their life be examined, whether they live piously well catechumens, whether they honored the widows, whether they visited the sick, whether they have fulfilled every good work. That's the scrutiny. If those who bring them witness to them that they have done thus, then let them hear the gospel. That is last preparation for baptism. And then the next paragraph 
describes this highly ornate, highly choreographed set of events that would move a person to Easter morning when they'd be baptized. And in many, in the early Christian period, most baptism took place naked. And the baptismal font was outside the church. They'd be given a white robe after baptism. They'd be ushered into church where the congregation was waiting for them to applaud, welcome them, give them the kiss of peace, and then all of them would take the Eucharist together. Oh, there'd be anointings in there too, which are called chrismation or confirmation. So you get the idea of how kind of elaborate this set of events was. The choreography, again, underscoring and illustrating the significance of passing into the actual life of the church. I wish we could read that, but we don't have uh, time. Instead, I want to conclude with just uh, a couple of comments so we have some time for questions. Now, we can't return to an earlier phase of history. I always tell my students that. There's no golden age, and even if there was, we couldn't return to it anyway. So my intent in these concluding comments is not to advocate a return to the ancient catechumenate, but to encourage openness to a modern adaptation. The idea of muscular Christianity has resurfaced in the last 150 years, leading to such institutional embodiments as the YMCA. I don't know if you knew that. That's one of the reasons why it was formed. And uh, Promise Keepers, and to such uh, uh, best-selling books as Wild at Heart. I know you're familiar with that. Needless to say, these modern adaptations tend to depart from this original version of muscular Christianity because in the original version, it was not about athletic competition at all, but about deep devotion to Christ's lordship. It appears the church fathers were not as literalistic about athletics as we are today. They cited athletic metaphors, not to inspire men to fight as gladiators in the arena, but to motivate believers to remain faithful to the gospel, even under threat of persecution or martyrdom. Maximus of gladiator fame was not their hero. Who were their heroes? Perpetua, a 22-year-old martyr who had just given birth to a baby. Polycarp, an 86-year-old bishop. And Antony, the greatest of the desert fathers. So two concluding applications. The first concerns how we educate at Christian colleges and universities, at schools like Westmont and Whitworth. To remain competitive, we have to educate our students well, as I mentioned in chapel, and prepare them for graduate schools in the job market, which, put, which put, puts pressure on schools like ours to educate students in pretty conventional terms. We are, after all, competing with elite institutions that often define the standards of success against which we measure ourselves, hence Whitworth's rankings in U.S. News and World Report and Westmont's. I'm curious how our educational goals and methods would change if we aim to train students and not merely educate them, and train them not only in traditional academic disciplines, though that's obviously very important, I do that job myself, but in life as well. If Westmont is anything like Whitworth, this task is less lar left up largely to the chaplain's office, maybe to resident directors. It's not expected of faculty who spend their time teaching classes, producing scholarship, sitting on committees and advising students. How would such a goal shape the curriculum of the institution and the role of faculty? It's just a curious question that I'm thinking about in my role at Whitworth. What if we start thinking more about training and less about educating? The second concerns what the church should do to adapt the ancient catechumenate to a modern setting. It might not be possible to train candidates for three years before they become official church members. Most churches add people to the roles largely through transfer of membership anyway. Would we still want to meet and mandate a three-year training program if a Baptist was to become an Anglican? Probably not. Still, the principles of the catechumenate could be applied to Christians as they pass through important rites of passage. In each case, the church could shape some kind of modified catechumenate to help people discover what it means for them to live as genuine disciples of Jesus, the rite of passage providing the opportunity. So, for example, we um, think about parents bringing their children or infants uh, for baptism. That would be true of Presbyterians, Anglicans, and so on and so forth. How about if we would require them to meet for three or four months with a veteran couple who would raise children? And that veteran couple could disciple these parents into how to raise their children as disciples, 
as followers of Jesus, as Christian athletes. Instead of an hour meeting with the pastor, why not a kind of curriculum that these veteran parents would bring them through before baptism? Or how about in the case of marriage? Instead of a pastor meeting for three or four sessions of pre-marriage counseling, how about if we trained a group of veteran couples who are well-proven in marriage, and they meet with uh, 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 couples wanting to be uh, preparing for marriage for eight, 10, or 12 sessions. So they're mentored. Now, there's two examples of a kind of modified catechumenate for a modern setting. How about churches uh, requiring uh, elected elders to go through a year-long training program before they start to function as elders, and veteran elders lead that program for them? Churches would discover over time that an emphasis on training people in the faith would forever change the culture of the church, starting uh, with the people who do the training. In short, training the trainers, veteran parents, veteran couples, veteran elders, already well proven, would enlarge the pool of mature believers, establishing a foundation upon which to build a healthy church. Over time, the church would thrive, not because it had a popular pastor, or because it ran popular and successful programs, both of which appeal to the consumer orientation of American culture, but because it equipped the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ.